This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning, we have a special visitor today. Alan Braverman is here from WashU. Alan and I uh, crossed paths during residency. He was actually my junior resident when I was an intern. So I was a BI, he was at the Brigham, and we, those two programs intersected at both the VA and at, uh, at the Dana-Farber. And I, I think Alan was my uh, junior resident when I was at the VA and uh, convinced me that I needed to do more research and less clinical medicine because he was really good at clinical medicine and I was like barely surviving as an intern. So I saw less and less patients throughout my career. Uh, and, and I left real clinical medicine to uh, uh, people like Alan. Alan has, uh, did his uh, residency and fellowship and was a chief resident too at the Brigham and did his cardiology training there and then went to Wash U and has spent his entire career at Wash U. Uh, and very early on got interested in aortic disease and uh, has worked with the Marfan Foundation throughout his career has been very involved in that foundation, which as many of you know is a very unique one that has strong family involvement, et cetera, um, and has really built a, a strong, extremely strong clinical career, but with a lot of interest in aortic disease and the genetics of aortic, aortic disease. And uh, as you can see, he's gonna tell us about that today, talk about genetic aortopathies and tell us all about it, how, how it's all solved at this point, right? Thank you, Robert. Well, thank you very much. Um, and you are a, a superstar intern, uh, actually, and uh, I've I'm glad to see you've done even, uh, even better as a researcher and, uh, and as a leader. So today I do want to speak about um, what I've learned over caring for people and families over uh, my career with genetic aortopathies. And it is true, I'm still learning. I'm still re-diagnosing or undiagnosing or changing the diagnosis of people that I see that I thought had one condition and now it has something else, or I'm managing them differently from what I've learned. Um, Marfan syndrome is kind of the prototype, and it was uh, um, given the name based on the first description by Antoine Jean-Bernard Marfan, who's a French pediatrician. He really studied uh, tuberculosis, but uh, described the case of Gabrielle P. over 100 years ago, who lived her entire life at the hospital in Paris. And you can see from the picture, she had uh, elongated feet and toes and elongated fingers but she also had uh, contractures. And what is uh, the condition which was labeled after the, this girl as Marfan syndrome, we think really is a different fibrillinopathy, congenital contracture, arachnidactyly. And most of the natural history of Marfan syndrome was codified by the medical geneticists and cardiac surgeons and others at Johns Hopkins. And you can see that um, in the day before cardiac surgery was available, people with Marfan syndrome would live very short lives because of the aortic disease and heart failure from aortic regurgitation with the average or median cumulative probability of survival under 50 years at that time compared to the normal population. Um, our site and others contributed over 400 patients now 20 years ago, redefining the clinical history of Marfan syndrome. So people who are diagnosed and then treated successfully and you can see that the lifespan is much different once the condition is recognized, really because of prophylactic surgery. I became interested in Marfan and other conditions really based on my own family history. So this, for those of us who are old enough to recognize the, uh, the style of the day, this is 1976, the Braverman family, and the leisure suit was in style then, <laughs> for those of uh, us who remember. This was me, and this is my twin brother, and this is my brother and sister who are twins. These are my parents, my younger brother. This is my oldest brother. This is Alfred, he's a visiting foreign exchange student who's lived with us from Greenland for a year. So 1976, and my dad was an orthopedic surgeon and um, he died six months after this picture of an aortic dissection and it really wasn't recognized why. He really didn't have any risk factors for it. And I didn't really know a lot about medical genetics in high school, we always thought my brother was tall because he didn't have to share any nutrients in the womb with the other twins in the family. So um, anyway, I went into a six-year medical school out of high school into college. I always knew I wanted to be a cardiologist. And uh, when I got my stethoscope, I went home and listened to everybody's heart in the family. And my oldest brother had a pretty loud heart murmur. 
So I went to my docent, who was a cardiologist, and told him about it. He said, your brother needs an echo. And um, he had an echocardiogram. And he had a dilated aorta and mitral valve prolapse. And then when I was a medical student, I went to Johns Hopkins to do a rotation there, and I sought out Reed Piritz, who at the time was a leading researcher and clinician on Marfan syndrome, and talked to him about my family and my brother. And he said, uh, I think you do have Marfan syndrome in your family, and that's uh, what your brother likely has. And he went to Johns Hopkins, where his seven centimeter aortic root was successfully operated on. And when I came to Wash U, we started a Marfan clinic um, because of that. And it's really grown into an incredible enterprise, from very small to very large part of my practice now is caring for people who have genetic aortopathies. We've hosted the Marfan Foundation Conference a couple of times. Denver, who's here, has hosted it in Emory and, and uh, the Children's Hospital. And, and it's really a wonderful um, group of people. And you get to meet scientists and clinicians from around the world and become lifelong colleagues. So we'll start by talking about Marfan syndrome. It's a, uh, Disorder that can be diagnosed uh, by many different people, whether it be parents or educators or school nurses or ophthalmologists or cardiologists, depending upon what manifestation is um, clinically important. It's a dominant connective tissue disorder. It's recognized due to an FBN1 gene mutation leading to abnormal fibrillin protein. We don't really know the incidence. It's estimated about 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 10,000, and differing from many um, potentially lethal genetic disorders, about 25% of cases are a new mutation where 75% are passed from parent to child. And we'll talk about how to make the diagnosis. Sometimes it is diagnosed early in life and seen by pediatricians early in life because a neonatal Marfan or infantile Marfan with severe features and severe mitral regurgitation, but that's, that's the uncommon type. Most commonly diagnosed in childhood, adolescence, sometimes in middle age, sometimes in the 60s when uh, somebody has an aortic dissection because the uh, phenotypic features can be quite variable. But it is very important to try to make the diagnosis early, as we've mentioned. The FBN1 gene encodes a very large glycoprotein fibrillin. And um, we used to think that most patients and families had their own unique or private mutation, but as um, we're doing more and more genetic testing, we realize that many of the same mutations are repeated uh, in many other families. And over 3,000 different mutations have been reported. And I think this explains some of the phenotypic variability. Um, different mutations, different manifestations, different modifiers, even within families, let alone um, when different mutations are present. Fibrillin is a major protein in the extracellular matrix that uh, helps build the microfibrils, which are important in elastogenesis. And it was used to, th uh, used to be thought that really the abnormal protein in Marfan syndrome led to abnormal structure and then abnormal function, which degenerated and led to phenotypic consequences. But it's um, been recognized through mouse models that um, fibrillin is a very important regulating protein for signaling pathways, and that gives many targets for potential therapy. So how to recognize Marfan syndrome? When I work with the fellows in the clinic, it's a lot of fun. We'll see, um, you know, and depending on the day or the session, we might see two or three people with Marfan syndrome on a typical day in the clinic just coming back for routine. And, patient, and the fellows will say, uh, when are they going to look like somebody I expect to look like Marfan syndrome? And we've uh, put together our database of Marfan patients, and obesity is, is very common amongst our patients. And so someone may not look exactly um, like you might think they should look, but you can notice features that um, help make it recognizable. People with Marfan syndrome are typically tall. Like my father, who was six feet two, came from parents who are each about five, six. And my brother, who has Marfan syndrome, is six feet four, while the rest of us are about five feet nine. So typically tall for family. They don't have to be seven feet tall, but tall for the family is a typical feature. And as you can see here by these uh, five kids, uh, she doesn't have Marfan syndrome, but they do. You can see the elongated arms, long fingers, elongated face, small chin, sunken eyes. So some of the typical outward features you might recognize. Skeletal features are common, pectus carinatum being more specific than 
pectus excavatum, significant scoliosis, arm span greater than height by more than 5%, long feet, long fingers, long toes. So differing than many of the patients that we see in the clinic, you actually have to examine a patient with the clothes off or the gown on to, to, and, uh, with a tape measure in your pocket as well as a stethoscope to help make the diagnosis. Hyperflexibility is common, so thumb sign and wrist sign, certain features you can do very easily in the clinic. And all of these features are available online on a, a scoring system. And people with Marfan syndrome often have a certain face to them or look to them. Um, there are even facial recognition uh, apps you can use um, to uh, try to help you recognize patients. Now, this is not very sensitive and it's not very specific. I've done it on myself and my wife, and the, the first thing that comes up is Lowy's Dietz syndrome. So I'm not really sure it's as, as good as we'd like it to be, but um, anyway. Typical facial features, downsloping palpebral fissures, elongated face, sort of sunken eyes with less uh, adipose tissue behind the eyeball. And people with Marfan syndrome have crowded teeth and a tall palate. And obstructive sleep apnea is very common in Marfan patients because of the shape of the oropharynx. So you might not think about that in a tall, thin individual, but nocturnal hypertension is common in Marfan patients, and there may be increased risk of aortic complications because of the hypertensive response in um, uh, obstruct untreated sleep apnea. Patients with Marfan syndrome should have a slit lamp eye exam. About 60% will have uh, stretching of the ciliary zonules here, leading to uh, ectopia lentis. And people with Marfan syndrome have an elongated eyeball, so high myopia is common, and they're at risk for um, retinal tears, retinal detachment, and premature cataracts. Some patients with Marfan syndrome have kind of a shuddering of the iris when you have them turn their eyes from side to side. So sometimes you might see iridogenesis just on your clinical examination, but really a slit lamp eye exam is required for the diagnosis of this feature. And, and to date, there are very few other um, aortopathy conditions that associate with um, lens dislocation. Really, it's just Marfan syndrome. We do have, we have one case that um, we presented in abstract form of a patient with uh, Lowy's Dietz syndrome that had lens dislocation. It's the cardiovascular features that, that we, uh, as cardiologists and, and vascular specialists, have uh, a special interest in. The greatest majority of patients have root enlargement at risk for type A dissection. Descending aortic disease is being recognized more commonly as people live longer. Mitral valve prolapse is, is uh, present in the majority of patients, very myxomatous, thick valves that can be repaired by a skilled surgeon that can lead to significant mitral regurgitation. And we are seeing more branch vessel aneurysm disease in Marfan patients as we're screening more widely. Cerebral aneurysm seems to be very rare, though, in this condition. It's easy to recognize the features on standard echocardiogram, and it's reliably measured and reproduced over time, and then scored a Z-score based on the patient's age, sex, and body size to codify enlarged or not enlarged in growth rates. And we usually do cross-sectional imaging at least once um, early on and then periodically to survey the rest of the aorta. Apical pleural, pleural blebs are very common in Marfan syndrome due to the abnormal elastic tissue, and about 5% of patients do present with spontaneous pneumothorax. This is exacerbated by cigarette smoking. And a very important feature to recognize is lumbosacral duralactasia. So compared to the normal appearance of the sacrum, connective tissue disorder patients like Marfan and, and others have abnormal dural canal. So the dura is lined with connective tissue, and just because of the pressure of the column of fluid in the spinal uh, canal, it enlarges over time. And uh, this is very important to recognize because you'll see this on your imaging. And our radiologists typically mention this for us, but sometimes it's not mentioned, or you may not read the bone window pictures when you're looking at the aorta. So this is also known as other features like Tarloff cysts or sacral cysts, things like that. But you can see here how this is all pooched out. It can lead to meningocele,s chronic pain, and er erosion of the lamina and pedicles. And if you just remember the appearance here, it's very simple. There's a kind of a clue. It really much has a, a picture of Mickey Mouse. So you look for the Mickey Mouse sign when you're seeing patients with unexplained aortic disease, especially young people. 
This is a CT scan of a 55-year-old woman who came to see us emergently. She had a type A dissection at the Lake of the Ozarks about two hours from St. Louis and was flown to Barnes for emergency surgery and uh, she didn't have a lot of phenotypic features of a connective tissue disorder on quick glance, underwent successful surgery and this was her imaging of the dissection. You can see in the black arrows how she had lumbosacral dural ectasia and this is the cross section here. So this really helped to identify this is a person with a connective tissue disorder and she um, did test positive for Marfan syndrome. Stretch marks are common in people who, who gain weight or lose weight or pregnancy or uh, you know, lift weights, things like that, but are really pronounced in connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome. And they're places where you typically don't see them. So on the mid portions of the back, um, up around the axilla, and on the upper arms. So look for those as well. And this is a scoring system that I mentioned. So um, when, you, when we use the um, revised GINT criteria, all of these different uh, clinical features, some require imaging, but some you can do just at the bedside are available. And if you go to MarfanDX, you can download it on your, smart, on your phone, and you can see examples of each of these uh, sort of clinical features and then the points that go along with them. And what's interesting is, is again, this is really important and something we talk about in the clinic all the time when seeing these patients and families is, is many people don't have high systemic scores, yet do have Marfan syndrome. So when, when these are present, it does highlight you should look for Marfan syndrome. But, but many people have just minor features, and of course, it's very subjective, what's a flat foot and what's a hind foot deformity and how much pectus is a pectus deformity um, and what are the spatial features and things like that. And of course, many of these features are common in the general population. And then screen all family members. So this family, this is the woman whose CT scan I showed you who had lumbosacral dural ectasia, who had the type A dissection. Um, now when you look at her more carefully, you can see she does have a, a little bit of straightening of her eyes. She has very elongated fingers here. And this is her husband, so they're not related genetically. And there's her three children. So we've learned a little bit about Marfan syndrome. Um, which of the children have Marfan syndrome? Who votes for all of them? They all have it. They all have Marfan syndrome. And you might think these two boys have it. They're certainly taller than everybody else. She's taller than her mom who has it. But they all tested positive for the same um, fibrillin mutation that, that um, she carries. And it's very important to screen all family members clinically or genetically so then you can uh, image and then follow uh, prospectively. And uh, his daughter, Ophelia, she doesn't look like she has Marfan syndrome, but she did. She has the same. FBN1 gene mutation. So again, it highlights how important it is to look at everybody very uh, critically in a family because the phenotype can be variable. And in young people, of course, it can develop over time. Certain mutations in fibrillin and FBN1 um, are pathogenic, and especially the changes in cysteine residue. So they're predictive models, just like in any genetic condition, about what type of gene mutation will lead to a pathology. The criteria to make the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome is based on the revised Gantt nosology from uh, 10 years ago now. And it really involves the cardinal features, so aortic enlargement plus something else, aortic plus lens dislocation, an FBN1 gene mutation, or a high systemic score will all satisfy the criteria for Marfan syndrome in a patient that's a proband. It requires a little less when there's a family history. Now, it's very important because we've recognized since this many other genes which can lead to features similar to Marfan syndrome, but can behave much differently. So again, if somebody doesn't have lens dislocation or an FBN1 gene, but they have an enlarged aorta and some of the features of Marfan syndrome, always be suspect, are you sure it's Marfan syndrome and not something else? In 2005, um, we were invited to go to Johns Hopkins to uh, uh, hear about um, a, a trial that was being planned based on the laboratory work in animal models from Hal Dietz and, and Bart Lowy's looking at the um, mouse model of Marfan syndrome and its response to Losartan. Um, so we are very interested in this and we joined in with many others from the Pediatric Heart Network. But before we talked about planning of that study, um, Bart Lowy's, who was a grad student in Howe's lab, 
told us about uh, 14 patients, 10 families, that they described having a different condition that were referred to Hopkins or followed there for the possibility of Marfan syndrome or something like Marfan syndrome. But instead of being due to a uh, FBN1 gene mutation, was due to mutations in transforming growth factor beta receptor 1 and 2, so TGFBR1 and 2. And then, so they talked about this to a group of patients and then published their story. <coughs> so this was even before it came out. We, we got to learn about this, which again, as a clinician and someone who's interested in this, was, was really highly informative and, and uh, emphasized to me the importance of, of these collaborations and, and uh, friendships over time when new discoveries are being made. So like Marfan syndrome, what condition which we now call Loewy's Dietz syndrome, had pectus deformities and scoliosis and arachidactyly, so a lot of the outward features which might be similar to Marfan syndrome, but it differed. Patients with this condition had um, abnormal shapes of the head, craniosynostosis and hypertellurism, wide set eyes, and abnormalities of the facial structure with broad trifid or bifid uvula and very tortuous arteries, different than Marfan syndrome, much more aggressive tortuosity. You can see tortuous arteries in Marfan syndrome, but not typically like this. This is a, uh, an infant with these curly Q uh, aorta and these 360-degree curves in uh, cerebral arteries. And again, differing than Marfan syndrome, they had very aggressive arteriopathy with uh, aortic dissection early in life, much, much different, and branch vessel involvement, much different. So it wasn't much longer after that visit, maybe a week or so. Um, I was in the clinic and uh, Emily came by to see me as an initial patient. She'd said, uh, I got too old to be at the children's hospital anymore, so uh, I, you're gonna be my doctor. And uh, she said, she was very proud of the fact that she said, I'm the shortest Marfan patient you're ever gonna see, Dr. Braverman. She's very proud of that. And I looked at Emily and I said, you know what? I, I think you have something I learned about last week. I, I, and of course, I hadn't gone to the meeting. I wouldn't, wouldn't know anything about what I'm gonna tell you about. But you can see here, she had wide set eyes, she had bluish sclera, she had some abnormal enamel of her teeth. And when I met Emily, she was about 21, but she'd had two aortic surgeries already as a 21-year-old, so very aggressive. And um, Silkman, same thing. This woman I had followed for Marfan syndrome had had an aortic dissection, and her aortic root was only 3.9 centimeters under my watch, and it really bothered me. You know, that's not the way Marfan syndrome is supposed to behave. Why did that happen to her? It's such a small aortic size. And uh, these were the days when we used to admit patients to hospital for bridging of anticoagulation um, way back when, and, and she had to come into the hospital for an anticoagulation problem. And I looked at her, and I just thought about her differently. And I think one of the most important lessons that I've had the opportunity to learn by working with others and seeing these patients and working with geneticists is to how to become a better dysmorphologist, to kind of look at people a little bit differently when, when you start to recognize features of disorders. And now you can recognize that she has wide set eyes and a prominent head. And um, I had never looked in her mouth before. Why would I look in her mouth for any reason? Why would a cardiologist do something like that? So I said, does someone open your mouth? And she had had cleft palate surgery which uh, was in her record, but I didn't really put that together, that this was part of this condition and a bifid uvula. And very abnormal enamel of her teeth, which is, again, a common feature of Loewy's Dietz syndrome. And so um, she had all the features, which we now recognize as that, and uh, did have a TGFBR2 mutation. And uh, this was in the day before it was commercially available, so we just sent samples to Hal and BART, and they would extract the DNA. And, and uh, in the early days, I had a hit rate of 100%. Every time I sent a research sample, it was right, um, because that's, those are the patients I was testing. This family came from Oklahoma for why did we have such aggressive aortic disease in our family? And uh, the guy, Josh, who I saw, uh, came with his whole family. He had no health insurance. Uh, we saw him in a back room in, uh, in the clinic, um, and one of the uh, ECHO people was got him a free echo, um, and that was back in the day when we could do things like that. Um, and he had a dilated aorta. But he didn't have a lot of features of, of uh, Marfan syndrome. He didn't have a lot of features of Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Had very abnormal feet. The appearance of his feet was abnormal. So again, when describing to him, these are the things I'm gonna look for. You know, do you have this or do you have this? And I'm trying to explain, I'm gonna look in your mouth. Uh, you know, the piece of flesh that dangles in your throat 
Does anybody, do you or does anyone in the family have one that's split in two like a snake's tongue? And they all started pointing at dad who was there who'd had composite root replacement because he didn't have it, but his uh, father did. And again, when I'm talking to patients and families, um, another thing that I've been able to learn from, from doing this for a while is, that, is ask everybody, if you don't have this, maybe somebody else in the family is gonna be the one that's informative for the diagnosis. So very important to kind of talk about the features that you're gonna look for out loud and say, if you don't have them, think about anybody in the family. Because um, most people talk about things like this at family reunions. Okay, so Loewy's Dietz syndrome differing than Marfan syndrome are due to mutations in TGF beta receptors and now many other of the subunits and uh, other signaling uh, uh, proteins in the uh, canonical pathway. Differing than Marfan, um, most are de novo mutations and there's a lot of debate about what are the basic mechanisms here, uh, especially when there are loss of functions of the receptor leading to either increased or decreased TGF beta activation. A lot of debate amongst the scientists about what is exactly going on there and uh, what targets might be available to um, manipulate this disorder, not just in the animal model, but of course in people. There are cardinal features of this, which we'll review, because if you see this in a patient, you have to think of one of these conditions now. Arterial tortuosity can be seen in Marfan syndrome, but again, it's much more pronounced. These are the six genes that are now associated with Loewy's Dietz syndrome. The first three have the most aggressive aortic disease. TGFB2 looks a lot like Marfan syndrome, and that's the one patient that we do have with this mutation has lens dislocation. We have 30, we feel, follow, I think, 30 people with TGFB2 mutations now. One has lens dislocations. That's very, very unusual to have that first, first reported one. But again, you can see the tortuous arteries, um, very abnormal aorta. This is in a 25-year-old woman. So branch vessel dilatation, overlapping but differing. And again, Chiari malformation. So when seeing a patient with Loewy's Dietz syndrome or suspected, we image really from head to pelvis with CT angiography or MR angiography. And you have to do other uh, imaging. You have to look at the cervical spine because instability of the cervical spine is very common in this condition. That's very important in anesthesia planning. So again, patients get undressed. They put gowns on. We look at the skin. Patients with Loewy's Dietz syndrome can have super soft, velvety skin, um, abnormalities of the feet, toes, skeleton, mouth, head, eyes. Here's some of the feet. This is uh, joint contractures in one patient with Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Look in the mouth, you can see a broad uvula. Here's one with a raf, raffe, and then the patient whose father we saw with a classical bifid uvula. Talked about the skin. The skin of some patients with Loewy's Dietz, it, it looks like somebody with vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So there's a lot of overlap in those phenotypes. You can see the easily visible veins throughout the skin, super soft, and they can have atrophic scars, widened scars, scars that don't heal well, very common. We described several families, several patients who had prominent facial milia, as Kyle did here. You can see he had wide set eyes, and he had a, a multiple facial milia, and we recognize this pattern in several people, and I still see this now in people and get uh, emails about this from families that they also have the same condition. So there are a lot of uh, interesting features that can be recognized at the bedside. When we contributed patients to the largest series to date in uh, Loewy's Dietz syndrome, there were just 50 families, 52 families and 90 patients in this paper, and again, um, this was the tip of the iceberg. I told you that we had a 100% hit rate for making this diagnosis because we looked for all the features before sending mutation analysis. And it had a very sinister, very difficult um, prognosis at the time. Aneurysms were widespread, and the more severe the cranial facial index, or the more severe the, the outward features, so hypertellurism, bifid uvula, cranial synostosis, blue sclera, cleft lip, cleft palate, the more of those features, the more aggressive the arteriopathy. And you can see the mean age of death was very young, much younger than in Marfan syndrome, at least in the earliest description. And just like anything, I mean, that changes over time with uh, 
screening others and, and better recognition of subtle phenotypes and more widespread testing of patients with um, unexplained arteriopathy. I want to focus a little bit about how variable the phenotype can be. This is a family that we saw that we see with um, thoracic disease. So 10 years ago or so, this man was evaluated in Kansas City. They thought he might have Marfan syndrome. He was tall, relatively tall, and had many of the skeletal features. Did not had a normal uvula, no lens dislocation though, and his aorta was dilated at 4.4 centimeters. And he had no family history of any aortic disease. But um, just a few months later, um, they did gene testing, and this was commercially available at the time. FBN1 and TGFBR2; those were the two genes available at the time, the Marfan and Lowy's disease type 2, and there were no mutations. But um, he died just a few months later of an acute uh, type A dissection, and his aorta had just been 4.4 centimeters. And so um, his sister and mom and dad came to see us to say, you know, if we could help figure out why. And uh, she has many more dysmorphic features, and this was a picture just after his graduation of this family. And um, both mom and dad came, and um, Jen came, and I looked at the parents, and I'll ask you the same question I had is, um, you know, we were very suspicious that she was going to have a connective tissue disorder. He had aortic disease, and uh, where did it come from? Who, who thinks that mom is responsible for passing this gene on? Let's show of hands. Who thinks dad is? I mean, he looks like dad, and she looks like mom. And, but that's the way families are. You kind of look like your parents. So we tell people that all the time. It uh, doesn't mean you have that gene. So it highlights the importance of genetic testing. We tested both of them. Um, you can see her features. She has wide set eyes, gray sclera. And, and uh, you know, when you look for blue sclera, again, I'm, um, I'm not very good with colors anyway. But uh, what I like to do in the clinic is, is I like to have somebody, usually me, put my eyes right next to the person's eyes. We put our heads together, especially when I recognize the sclera or, or gray or bluish, and I'll have the fellow whose eyes are whiter. And it helps them realize that, just like taking a color swath and putting it next to another one. When there are subtle differences, when you look at one next to another, it's much easier to say that's a difference. So that's what we do in the clinic, and it's very, very instructive. But you can see the shape of her head, the small chin, the malar hypoplasia, soft skin. She had duralactasia. Her brother, she has many more of the outward features, yet her aorta is smaller than her brother. Um, so interesting. And of course, she did have a TGFBR1 mutation, which he had not been tested for because it wasn't available at the time. And it was mom that carried the same gene that, uh, that their children had. And interestingly, mom, who's a generation older, his aorta has been 3.9. So again, highlights how variable this can be um, and the importance of, again, screening everybody genetically when, a, when you know the gene to see who has the condition. Okay, so again, when you see these outward features, think of these disorders. And some are familial without a lot of disorders, and we'll talk about those. In our patient population, we used to see lots of people with Marfan syndrome. We're seeing many more now with aortic disease in the family, some with hereditary aneurysm disorders for which we can give a name, but many other familial thoracic disease, but we don't have the gene understood in the family. If you look at all patients who have aneurysm disease, type A dissection, unexplained aneurysm disease, about 20% will have an affected first degree relative highlighting the importance of screening families when you see somebody with a di uh, type 1 dissection or thoracic aortic aneurysm. Some associate with cerebral aneurysms. It's an autosomal dominant condition. There's a, quite a variable penetrance in expression, especially in women, maybe quite variable in women. But screen first degree relatives. If you have a family where there are multiple generations with aneurysm disease, the likelihood of finding one of the genes that we recognize is only about 20 30 percent. So the greatest majority of families where we know it's running in the family, we still don't recognize the gene today. And that highlights how much discovery there is and how many genes are yet uh, undescribed. If you look in a sporadic mutation, or sorry, a sporadic dissection and say what's the likelihood of finding a, gene, a gene if one person has a dissection that doesn't have outward features of a syndrome, it's about 3 to 5 percent, depending upon the patient population. If you screen 
by saying, okay, what if you're less than 50 and don't have hypertension, and, and there may be a family history of something, sudden death, then it's about 10%. So again, genetic testing can be helpful, but the majority of people, even that we know there has to be something more than hypertension, we're not gonna find that gene. But it still is important to look. And there are lots of genes. We can do whole panels of genes, whether they involve the extracellular matrix, TGF-beta signaling pathway, or abnormalities of vascular smooth muscle. And what I think is fascinating and interesting and what fills the room when we have uh, um, gen tech meetings or scientific consortiums is all the different pathways that are involved in the homeostasis of the aortic wall, whether it be in the elastic tissue or the smooth muscle cell or the connections between the two and the things that influence um, the way the aortic wall responds to stress um, mutations in each of these factors, whether it be receptors or smooth muscle genes or signaling elements, um, are all related to recognized aneurysm syndromes. And this should give a lot of targets for therapies um, based on animal models and other as we go forward. This is our, um, this is what keeps me busy as we, in our clinic, uh, we've been keeping a little database since uh, 2015. And so in the last four years now we have uh, not quite 500, 476 patients that we recognize which gene has led to their aneurysm that, that I follow. And uh, you can see the majority have Marfan syndrome due to an FBN1 gene mutation, but we're getting an increasing number of Loewy's Dietz syndrome. And, um, and of the other genes that we know are non-syndromic hereditary <laughs> aneurysm disease, it's a smaller part of the pie that I'm seeing, but an increasing proportion now in the last few years, more and more patients are being recognized with this. You say, what are the newest ones that we're seeing? It's actually more ACTA2 and others that are um, associated with non-syndromic aneurysm disorders. Okay, so let's say you have one of these conditions. Is there treatment for it? Well, we know that beta blockers are effective in lessening hemodynamic stress on aortic wall. This is based on 30 patients, 35 patients studied by uh, Reed Peretz and others at Hopkins going back to the uh, 1970s uh, to the 1980s using beta blockers showing slower grade of growth of the aorta. These are slopes of aortic growth curves in treatment versus non-treated patients. So that's a guideline to use beta blockers in patients with um, Marfan syndrome to lessen growth of aorta. When I, when I uh, explained about fibrillin and its um, um, configuration in the microfibrils is not just structural again, that it, that it also influences signaling pathways. In the mouse model, it's been recognized that the excess of TGF beta activation is present in, the, uh, in all the tissues that are involved in Marfan syndrome, whether it be the long bone growth, the, the alveoli in the lungs, the mitral valve, or the aortic wall. And it um, used to be pretty simple thinking that uh, the theory was that um, the normal situation was a healthy, normal uh, fibrillin-based microfibril through its binding of uh, proteins kept TGF-beta sequestered in the extracellular matrix. And with Marfan syndrome, with abnormal microfibrils, there wasn't this binding and TGF-beta was available to uh, uh, access the receptor and lead to, through a canonical signaling pathway, the pathogenic features of Marfan syndrome. And if you blocked TGF-beta, using a neutralizing antibody, you can prevent the Marfan mouse from developing any of the phenotype. And if you gave drugs like um, Losartan, which blocked TGF-beta, you could have some more effect. And that's why, based on that information, that the uh, Losartan trials were planned uh, 15 years ago. And looking at a normal mouse aorta compared to a Marfan mouse, uh, 1039 uh, haploinsufficient Marfan mice, here formed aortic root aneurysm, treated with beta blocker. There was less cystic mule degeneration, but still very abnormal aortic architecture, whereas with low sartan, it could recapitulate the normal architecture of the aortic wall and uh, no aortic dilatation. So that gave a lot of hope um, for Marfan mice. But what about people? In the early studies, uh, this was non-randomized, non-controls. Hal Dietz uh, and his group gave 17 patients who were very young, who had very aggressive aortic disease, Z-scores of seven, um, ARB therapy, predominantly low sartan or herbisartan. And really, once that treatment was started, um, the aortic growth rate 
basically ceased, went from three and a half centimeters, sorry, three and a half millimeters a year to a half a millimeter a year. So very, very impressive um, cessation or reduction of that growth rate. And trials were started, and some published in the, the trial that we participated in uh, was, is the largest to date, 600 patients in 21 centers from six months to 25 years, given very high doses of atenolol. Again, young people given up to 150 uh, milligrams on average of atenolol, much higher than we might use in the clinic, and uh, versus losartan in standard dose. And I think, again, one of the things that I learned in participating in this is, is uh, and it does change the way I think about my treatment is, is to give very high doses of this medication when treating patients, and it really didn't lead to much bradycardia, and patients tolerated it very well. And both, both arms, whether the losartan or the atenolol arm, reduced the z-score over time, meaning the aorta grew more slowly than the person's growth would have predicted. So that was positive for each. The absolute growth of the aorta did increase uh, by just about uh, one and a half um, uh, millimeters or so, three millimeters over uh, two millimeters over three years. So pretty slow growth for either curve and less than would be predicted, but there was no difference between the two groups, whether losartan treated or a beta blocker treated. So that was a, a trial that said either drug had slow growth, but losartan was, was not superior to um, atenolol. And the French had the same outcome as did the Spanish in similar sort of trials, no differences in outcomes. This was just published, the Ames trial, the herbisartan trial, and this looked at herbisartan on top of placebo, and the placebo was about beta blocker for just about half the patients continued on their own drug, and when losartan was added, uh, the losartan treated patients grew a little bit more slowly, but pretty, pretty um, small change, 0.2 millimeters per year. And you say, well, why? why? Why is there not a big difference in losartan versus beta blocker or others? And I think it, it probably has to do with many factors, um, whether it be different mutations in different people, uh, different modifiers in different people, or different targets in different, uh, in different species um, that are really playing a role. As, and uh, it might not just be a TGF beta um, responsive abnormality in Marfan syndrome. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the treatment of these conditions. Generally, surgery is recommended when the aorta is about five centimeters in Marfan syndrome. Um, there's not any randomized or controlled trials looking at that as a date. This is a large series from uh, Guillaume John Doe's group in France where patients come to, to Paris for their central screening every, uh, every other year. And you can see patients who's, who are being followed with aoras between 45 and 49 have low event rates, about 0.3% annual risk of an aortic event um, short of surgery. Um, and. Um, but about 20% of patients did have surgery in that group. So if you look at 50 to 54, you can see the event rate's a little bit higher. Um, but I think you can feel safe in most people to have surgery about five centimeters in Marfan patients, unless there are other factors present. So there is nuance if someone's very young with an aorta approaching that, if the aorta is growing rapidly, if there's a family history of dissection, if surgery is required, pregnancy is desired, or if they've had a prior type B dissection, that probably informs more risk at a smaller size. And finally, some, some patients and surgeons just want to go forward when it's less than five centimeters because of their own individual concerns and the desire to do a valve sparing surgery. So there's preference involved as well. In Loewy's Dietz syndrome, due to TGFBR1 and 2 mutations, when in, uh, first the uh, cases and first series were described, because of the very aggressive aortic growth, uh, four centimeters was big enough to recommend surgery, much different than Marfan patients. In 2010, when the TAD uh, guidelines were published in circulation and others, the uh, experts at the time had a little bit bigger aortic size, um, really without any new information, but, but, but um, just a differing of opinion about exactly when. We've been involved, and in, um, Denver's involved with the Montalcino Aortic Consortium, which is a large group of uh, clinicians and scientists and geneticists and, uh, interested in aortopathies from around the world. And uh, the goals of this consortium is to try to uh, accumulate as many known hereditary thoracic aortic aneurysm disease genes, and then what happens surgically, medically, natural history, pregnancy, a lot of clinical features, and uh, specific genotypes which might predict uh, outcomes as well to try to study this. 
and uh, over a thousand patients have been uh, uh, enrolled and data uploaded so far, and we participated in this study now, the 441 patients, largest series to date of, of TGFBR1 and 2 mutations, and you can see differing than the first paper I, uh, that we talked about from, from uh, 10 years, to 6 years earlier, um, survival was much greater in this, again, because of probably preclinical diagnosis and earlier surgery. Uh, some patients had already dissected by the time they entered the trial, but a lot had preventative aortic surgery. And again, looking at this large population, aortic diameter at the time of dissection was smaller in certain patients, those with TGFBR2 mutations in women, and then this theme again, the more systemic features, the more aortopathy risk there was. So really we kind of think about four to four and a half centimeters with earlier surgery, especially in females with smaller size, TGFBR2 mutations, and more severe cranial facial features. So there's a lot of nuance in trying to make this and shared decision making in, in uh, aortic size. And I think this is very interesting paper from Diana Milowitz looking at the hereditary thoracic aneurysm disease non-syndromic due to ACTA2, which is the most common non-syndromic familial. And this is the, uh, the whole population. You can see about 50 percent risk of aortic events at 50 years old, but certain genes like the R179 mutation shifts to the left with much more aggressive aortic disease, a little bit more aggressive than the average in the R256 mutation, and a shift to the right for this mutation. So there may be differences that we may learn more in precision when we learn, when we look at large data sets to try to help us predict events. And um, I made up this slide, but um, it's really just a very, very rough framework to try to think about, you know, how big, depending upon what gene, and you can see it varies between four and five centimeters for many of the recognized genes, but there's so many other features to consider as opposed to the gene alone. And uh, really, I think the most important thing is a shared decision between you and your patient and your surgeon about um, what's happening to the person, their size, and uh, how successful things are going to be depending on what kind of procedure they want to have. And that typically today involves valve sparing root replacement for the majority, which is very successful in the most recent uh, um, Marfan uh, uh, data set. Uh, there's about a 15 percent uh, two plus uh, AR at five years uh, for valve sparing root replacement. So you do have to think about that as opposed to the durability of composite valve graft, but we're choosing more valve sparing root replacement. Okay, for the last uh, few minutes of the talk, I'm going to talk about lifestyle modification, something I'm really interested in, in, in because our patients with these conditions are going to live a long life now. So we want to give advice and talk about how to help them live a very long life with a genetic aortopathy. So first is just education. They have to know about it, what to expect, when to get followed, to, to tell us that they have the condition when they present, teach us about it when they know more about it than we do because of uh, uncommon conditions and to know what a dissection might feel like and when to advocate for uh, evaluation of that when they present with uh, chest pain or back pain or un unusual symptoms, which could be a dissection. And to explain to patients that they are at risk for distal disease, that uh, uh, fixing the root with a, a valsalva graft or other still leads to risk of descending dissection, 10 percent incidence within the first seven years of the first surgery, so it's very important to tell people about this so they get imaged for it have a lot of discussions about physical activity, work, uh, exercise, um, and uh, try to make shared decisions again. Competitive athletics are pretty much out for aortopathy, but recreational athletics are very important um, for patients, and uh, this is really uh, based on very little information. Um, we don't want anybody to look like this in the clinic. And because of the uh, risk of aortic disease with intense isometric exercise, and there are, you know, rare case reports of uh, dissection occurring during intense weightlifting, and sometimes Marfan syndrome is recognized as a cause of sudden death in an athlete, but it's very uncommon. If you look at the big pie of sudden death in athletics or sudden death in participation sports, it's 1 percent is aortic disease. So it's a very small piece of the pie, probably because of better recognition of the syndromic causes um, of uh, of um, aortopathy. Um, th this I found really interesting, though. If you look at the paper from the Columbia group who did uh, 
imaging of uh, all professional basketball players whose average height is about 6'6 and BSA of 2.38, you can see that the average aortic root dimension is about 34 millimeters or so. And very few people have aortas more than four centimeters. So again, when you see patients in the clinic, if you have a man, uh, and a, let's say a younger person, if you're middle age or older, the aorta can get a little bit bigger, especially if you're an athlete younger in life, we're learning more about that. But four centimeters or more, unless you're really tall, it's gonna be a marker for a man, and about 35, certainly 36 would be enlarged for a woman. So if you see somebody like that, you gotta think about, is it, uh, are you sure it's just tall stature? Because the aorta doesn't continue to increase in size in very large patients. It, it, it does tail off here at the end. And if you looked at the largest aortas in these athletes, um, mitral valve prolapse was much more common in those athletes, making you really think about what connective tissue disorder do they really have. If you did this as a screening, so this was uh, elite volleyball players that were screened on the national teams, four screened positive. Again, four centimeters in a male, 3.4 in a female, and two of the four had pathogenic gene mutations in actionable genes associated with aneurysm disease. So again, you have to think about that when you're screening. When we wrote about um, these sort of guidelines and how to, how to uh, recommend things for people with uh, athletics that want to compete. Again, very little data, all based on consensus, making it very difficult to have hard and fast rules. But I think uh, one of the things that seems to be working out pretty well is if, you, again, if you see somebody whose aorta is a little bit big for a man or a woman and they have no other features, think about genetic testing in that family. Think about the family history. And when it's negative, we, we do share a decision and let them play with careful observation, not knowing if they'll have a, a change over time or not, uh, because some do. Some aortas continue to enlarge, and then that does change um, recommendations for athletics, and it does disqualify people later in life, which can be a, a big challenge, as it was for this guy who was diagnosed at uh, Isaiah Austin, who was diagnosed at the NBA Combine as having Marfan syndrome for the, first, for the first time. Remarkable guy who was uh, not allowed to play in the NBA, but now he's playing professionally overseas. Um, and we're hoping the best that uh, his aorta uh, does well. As was the same with this gentleman who was diagnosed at the NBA Combine. Again, it's showing you how difficult it can be for some to get recognized um, as having the condition and the importance of screening. We're doing a study looking at uh, safety of exercise in people who have had aneurysms resected. So Dave Watkins is the head of the Ironheart Foundation, and we've accumulated now 23 people who've had aortic surgery for aneurysm disease and returned to higher levels of endurance exercise. Um, and their mean age of surgery is middle age. You can see most were bicuspid valve aortopathy patients, six were th thoracic aneurysm disease, and one actually has an abnormal gene mutation. And uh, although, so this is a self-selected group that have chosen to do intense exercise, and it's really intense exercise with the sort of things that Jonathan, you'd be counseling people on, you know, Ironman and triathlon and marathon and endurance cycling as uh, Lou Cookson is doing here. You can see he has his aorta replaced and he's a champion uh, Ironman in his age group. Um, and uh, so we're accumulating this data to date and have uh, uh, information on 23 people and hope to present this at one of the meetings upcoming. Um, patients who've had dissections, of course, are worried about their lifestyle and exercise, and uh, we try to give advice about that. As you can imagine, most people are, are have depression and anxiety and are afraid to exercise um, because of worry about what could happen if the, if the exercise at all. And many are not even sexually active after aortic dissection. But what we try to tell our patients is, is those who do exercise have lower depression rates and less and lower blood pressure. So we're really interested in cardiac rehab after aortic dissection and certainly after aneurysm surgery. You just have to uh, target it uh, with safe levels of um, blood pressure and heart rate response. Finally, pregnancy is a risk for dissection. Um, compared to non-pregnant similar age women, there was a 20-fold 25-fold increase in this population study from Sweden of aortic dissection related to pregnancy. Uh, series in the United States are, have a smaller risk, about five-fold increased risk of a, an aortic dissection during pregnancy compared to similar age. Uh, we've looked at the IRAD database, and dissection only occurred in 1% of women in, in IRAD. 
Um, but if you looked at those less than 35%, about 20% of dissections were related to pregnancy, 60% um, during, 40% postpartum. You can see the aortic root was dilated, or the ascending aorta was dilated in type A's, but often normal size in type B's. And just like other conditions where we have recognizable genes and syndromes, about 60% were recognized to have an aortopathy. And that tells us, again, there are a lot of genes that we don't understand, and they're non-syndromic, so you wouldn't have a prediction that the, that the woman was at risk. Most information in Marfan syndrome uh, comes from Marfan patients, 1% aortic risk when the aorta is small, higher when it's bigger. So we image drown pregnancy, we have a multidisciplinary approach, but there's very little information about what if I had root replacement and want to become pregnant. So she asked us that question, and it made one of our residents to do a project on this. A literature review, we found 24 women with Marfan syndrome and pregnancy after root replacement in the literature had a very high dissection risk, which we really didn't think was what we were going to find in our own clinical population. So we did an online survey, and we took the data from our institution in Hopkins, and we had 20 pregnancies in our group, and there were no dissections compared to the 24 in the literature. So we think it's, there is a risk, but we don't think it's as high as the literature predicts, and it might be up to about 10% after root replacement. So we have to inform patients that, and then some make choices to uh, go ahead and expand their family after uh, successful aortic root replacement in Marfan syndrome. In Loewy's Dietz syndrome, though, it's much different. Um, we presented three women who had had root replacement with Loewy's Dietz syndrome and had pregnancy, and two of those three women went on to have an aortic dissection. In the literature, there's one other case of a woman with a dissection after successful root replacement. So three out of four. So I think it's different in Loewy's Dietz syndrome than Marfan syndrome. So to wrap up, uh, what I wanted to do today was just highlight what I've learned over my 28 years now in practice and in caring for patients with Marfan and these related disorders. And I think one of the most valuable lessons I've learned is how much value there is in uh, getting together with like-minded people, consortia, uh, societies, to share the information, share their data, share their social status, and to uh, give great hope for people who are living successfully with these. And these are some of the uh, foundations that are involved. And I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. That was fantastic. What a great tour de force there from fundamental mechanisms to uh, some clinical insights. We have time for a few questions. If folks have questions, they want to step up. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start. Oh, there, John. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. Uh, thanks, Alan. That was. Uh, Fantastic, as usual, getting to hear you speak. I just had a quick question about <clears throat> kind of your approach in regards to different types of exercise modalities and more recreational athletes, um, so not necessarily the competitive ones that you take care of with aortopathy, those who are runners versus those who are uh, lift, weightlifters. So it's a little bit easier to counsel the weightlifters. I always find it challenging for the runners uh, who are at, asking you know, what type or how long, how intense, uh, maybe those who are engaged in more uh, intense interval, uh, high intensity interval training as well. So I'm curious kind of what your approach is when you try to guide, guide uh, patients through that. Um, you know, what I, first thing I do is really ask, you know, what's your goal? What do you want to do? What have you been doing before? And uh, try to, to kind of share a decision about that, uh, understand, because for some people, um, you know, there's really, um, it's a kind of very modest, and they just want reassurance that doing things that everyone can agree on is safe to do. That's probably the biggest majority. Um, the most challenging ones are the ones that I say, well, I really don't know, and I'll, I'll just be upfront about that. So someone who says, you know, I, I want to be a marathon runner, and I have uh, Marfan syndrome, and my aorta is moderately dilated. Do you know it's safe? And I'll say, I really don't know, uh, because there's very little information to help me about that. So I'll say, you know, how do you feel when you're doing it? What's your mile pace like? You know, what's your heart rate during that? And things like that. I've put people on treadmills and things like that and, and see what happens to blood pressure response and things like that. Patients will say, um, you know, what, but I'm on a beta blocker. Doesn't that protect me? And I'll say, we don't really know that that protects you at all. But we want you to stay on your beta blocker. And, and we'll get sometimes a pushback and say, well, my heart rate's not going up. I don't feel like I'm getting my full uh, exertion. So we we'll have to have that sort of discussion. Um, but really, it's a matter of just kind of keeping some safe boundaries. And, and I guess um, I think I've become more relaxed, um, kind of like just as you are with your kids. The older they get, and the more you know that they're going to be okay, 
the more relaxed I am about that. And uh, we share a lot of decisions because we really don't know. As you mentioned, um, um, weightlifting is really the biggest one because I think there's a little bit better understanding about what can happen to aortas with just really intense valsalva maneuver with muscle fatigue as opposed to things where you want to tone and do reps and things like that, which I'm, I think is a great idea. And I, and, and we're learning more about this. And uh, the you know, study in the mice show that the Marfan mice that exercise, the aortas are better. They have better elasticity. They have better response to uh, hemodynamic stress. They look better ultrastructurally. Um, and that's up to about 65 to 70% maximum. So you say, well, uh, above that, they kind of lose that benefit. So I use that um, as sort of a, you know, a metaphor or an example for them really not knowing in people. Along those lines, given that, that we don't know what those surrogate markers are beyond growth, um, is there any interest in looking at exercise-induced changes in biomechanics uh, with stress echo or strain during exercise, uh, either the simple strain or even sort of more advanced strain as potential predictors of growth? Yeah, I, think there's a, there, I think there's a great opportunity for study. Um, you know, we're very interested in doing a cardiac rehab program for our patients after the most concerning group, the ones who have survived aortic dissection, who have dissection throughout the rest of the aorta to show that um, people feel better, that their blood pressure is stable or better, they have a better exercise tolerance, less, um, more uh, improved mental health, and to show that their aortas have not changed as, as uh, different than one would expect over time. And, but that, re that requires a study. So, I mean, the ideas that you have are, you know, they're outstanding ones because that's, that's what we need to do. Um, some patients grow more quickly. Some people have different blood pressure responses to the same level of exercise. So I do think that's the challenge on, on uh, just giving one sort of, um, you know, prescription for all. Um, in the patients that I've sent for cardiac rehab after aortic dissection, I'll get frequent phone calls from the cardiac rehab nurses saying, you know, this person's blood pressure is 160 with exercise. Is that okay with you? And it always makes me nervous because uh, I think, well, I don't know if that's okay with me. Uh, but the person says, well, I'm not doing that much. Um, so I, it's, it's something we have to learn. And we did a survey, we did a, just a, uh, we surveyed the IRAD uh, group and got uh, you know, a few dozen responses for, you know, what level of heart rate and what level of blood pressure would you accept for your person during exercise after an aortic dissection? And the responses were widespread from, you know, very widespread. So it just tells you how, um, how difficult it is to really come up with a consensus on what's safe. So I do think it's, it's a great place to study. And, and uh, um, if, if there's interest here, it's something that would be a great thing to collaborate. Uh, for both women who do not want to pass aortopathies onto their children, is there any role currently for in vitro fertilization with uh, a pre-genetic, with pre-implantation genetics? Yes, there is. So, um, so for all of our patients who um, we have uh, who are seeking pregnancy, we do recommend genetic counseling, and that is that is a discussion point for some, because you can certainly do genetic testing beforehand, find the gene, and there are methods to do um, uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So that is, a, that is a mechanism that's available. Uh, are there any coronary uh, issues with these patients, like dissection, coronary dissection? So um, coronary dissection, so if you look at all population of spontaneous coronary dissection, say, you know, is there a, a group that has a connective tissue disorder. There are. It's not common. It's it's a very small subset of all SCAD to have a Marfan or Lois Dietz or vascular Ehlers Danlos syndrome. So the current guidelines from the SCAD, the most recent SCAD document guidelines, would say don't do routine genetic testing unless there are features that might suspect it, like soft skin, velvety skin, bruising, you know, friable blood vessels on angiography, things like that. Um, I found one patient, I thought she would have vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome who had the FBN1 gene after a SCAD event. Um, uh, when talking to Mary Roman from uh, Cornell at a poster session, they presented two patients with uh, coronary dissections who had a connective tissue disorder. So it's a small subset. 
Well, as always, there's more questions than time with a great talk, but thanks so much, Alan. That was fantastic. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.